first visit. I'm going to do a little evangelizing. Uh, we're real proud. We spent years thinking about our welcome brochure. Well, this guy's going to be over there. So I would be deeply offended if he's not leaving the church. But seriously, it's got a little recap of the history of the church and other things about us. Uh, we're so glad to have you here today. We have proudly been associated with the Lincoln Group and today at the Illinois Society. John and I have read this up over coffee up at the uh, uh, 2009 in Gettysburg of the Symposium Lincoln Forum. Lincoln Forum. And uh, we've had a, a number, several each year since then. It's been a great uh, association. We, we are uh, very proud of the partnership. Uh, by the way, I'm welcome. I always on tours. And by the way, we're going to offer tour afterwards. If anyone would like to stay, I'll be delighted to take it around, especially our LinkedIn documents uh, in the next room or something like that. And it's all LinkedIn tomorrow. Abraham Lincoln did attend this church at the beginning of the first Sunday after his inauguration up to the end. So while he did attend other churches from time to time, this was an heat rented a few here and had a very close relationship with our pastor. But on a personal note, John, I heard me this morning that the little town I grew up in in Mississippi, we had some visitors coming down from Illinois uh, circa 1862. Uh, one of the Illinois units were 1862. 1862. Uh, I've got my signature correct. And one of them for three months was one of the leads I've not made, but a oh, resident yeah. named Melissa Grant, his wife, Julia. And as when I was a child, let's say in the 1960s, I always point out that Julia had her slave, which was part of the dowry, something of the Julia Grant's law of Missouri, was slave law. So uh, there's a lot of Grant folks who were in the course of Illinois. So happily, those people went away. Uh, Grant moved on down to Vicksburg, uh, which uh, had an impact on Missouri a few months later. So again, I'm delighted to have you all here. John, take it away. Well, I'll explain to uh, our mother who is co-host and uh, uh, sponsor the, uh, the Illinois State Society. Ross, uh, uh, Ross uh, uh, is here uh, representing the Illinois State Society. He's the volunteer uh, with this group. And uh, in the back, uh, Wade Karen is uh, Karen. Uh, professor of Economics at the uh, University of Chicago and uh, uh, author 
study of economics that influenced the New Deal. And uh, elected in, uh, first in 1948, along with Adlai Stevenson and Harry Truman, and my mother was knocking on doors for that ticket. So I have vivid memories of that, Senator Douglas. And I was reminded just the other day at the National Archives, where there was a program on the civil rights laws that were being passed 50 years ago, that uh, my, the, my other senator in those days was from my hometown of Eaton, Illinois, Everett McKinley Dirksen. And Everett Dirksen was key to the passage of the civil rights laws. Uh, we learned the other night that on the Voting Rights Act, 27 of the 33 Republicans voted for the Voting Rights Act. And Dirksen's strategy ensured that they would not be pulled off by the Southern Democratic bloc led by Richard Russell because he held secret meetings. And on that panel, uh, the other night at the archives was Carol Mosley Brown, the first female black senator, and uh, at her time the only black senator. And she told us that when she first arrived at the Senate and was assigned to her desk, she, of course, wanted to know who had previously sat at this desk. And these desks have been there since the Senate meeting was constructed. And she discovered that Stephen A. Douglas had used the text that she was using. So, uh, Douglas. What do we know about Douglas? Uh, what do you know about Douglas? The debate. This was uh, uh, the centennial stamp issue uh, of the debate. Lincoln standing, uh, Douglas behind him. So we know about the debate. What else do we know about Douglas? He ran for president. He actually ran for president three times, but it was only the third time that he got the nomination. Uh, anything else we know about Douglas? Jeremy the Interior. The Interior, wasn't it? It wasn't Interior, it wasn't called that in those days. What was the big issue? Where was the policy necessary? In new proposal? No, I'm talking about the big issue in the debate. Slaves are where? In the territories. Douglas, in his first arrival in Washington in the House, and then as senator, chaired the committee on the territories. As the committee chair, he was right in the middle. From the beginning, as we'll see in the uh, 1840s, well before the 1850s. So let's take a closer look at these two men. There's a lot of similarities. Neither of them was born in Illinois. Uh, they uh, left their families to uh, settle uh, in a different place. In the case of Douglas, he moved from, he was born in Vermont, uh, raised in New York, upstate New York, and uh, moved to Illinois. Uh, Lincoln. Born in Kentucky, raised in Indiana, moved to Illinois, and as soon as he was 21, left his uh, family too to uh, strike out in New Salem. Uh, both became lawyers uh, in a place where you didn't need to go to school to be a lawyer. All you needed to do basically was pass a moral exam uh, after having uh, an apprentice a little bit. And that was one of the reasons uh, Douglas came to Illinois, uh, because he stopped briefly in Cleveland and worked in a law firm and discovered that you actually had to know something about the law in a lot. So he discovered that in Illinois. Now, he uh, finally, both of them, made friends easily and jumped almost immediately into the rough and tumble world of politics uh, in, uh, in Illinois. Douglas uh, becoming a Jacksonian Democrat and Lincoln becoming uh, Henry Wait. At 21, Douglas arrived in Illinois, and uh, he uh, taught briefly, taught school. But then along came some state elections, and he campaigned energetically. 21 years old for the local Democratic ticket, and at 22, he made his impression. Little legally training or experience, he was named the state prosecutor for a district covering eight counties. 
but national politics was called. 1836, the election of President Douglas helped organize the first political party conventions in Illinois to ensure the nomination of this man, Martin Van Buren, uh, Jackson's vice president, his choice to succeed him. Loyal Jacksonian Democrats had to support Van Buren. Uh, it was here, in giving his stump speeches for uh, Van Buren as the presidential candidate, that he earned his name, the Little Giant. How tall was he? Five foot four. Uh, when they were debating, how tall was Lincoln? Uh, he wasn't taller, so you couldn't imagine a greater uh, contrast. Uh, the, uh, after serving two years as a prosecutor, Douglas runs for the state legislature. And there, uh, upon election, he arrives in Vandalia, Illinois. Uh, and there's a, another legislator uh, from uh, uh, Central Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln, this isn't necessarily the first time. And historians tell us that uh, Douglas was serving as a lobbyist in Vandalia even before he was uh, probably met Lincoln during Lincoln's first, first term. But Douglas was on the move. He was elected to the state legislature. Uh, but uh, he uh, didn't stay there very long. There's one anecdote about Douglas that just has to be told. And it really is credible because an Eastern is visiting Van Gogh, and uh, the legislature has just elected the senator, and it's a Democrat. And the Democrats are having a big celebration. And uh, Douglas is uh, part of this celebration. And this Easterner attended the event, and he writes this letter. Uh, to the consternation of the hosts and the intense merriment of the guests, two men, including Douglas and one other Democrat, climbed on the table at one end, encircled each other's waist, and to the tune of rollicking songs, pirouetted down the whole length of the table, shouting, singing, and kicking dishes, glasses, and everything right and left, Elder Skelter. One laugh of her, says Douglas, adapted well to frontier customs. Uh, he drank a lot. Uh, this would constantly be a problem uh, throughout his life. Uh, but he had a good time at that particular event. Let's take a closer look at, at uh, politics uh, in that year. There's the man, Andy Jackson. Uh, he had to go back to 1824 because this was what set the political world that uh, Lincoln and Douglas had. In 1824, Jackson uh, uh, was a, pres a presidential candidate. Uh, it was the first time there had been a contested presidential election since 1800. It had been the era of good feelings. Every president was a Democratic Republican. They were all elected by consensus in the Electoral College. Sort of passed down to Madison and then Monroe. Virginia sort of ran out of presidents, so uh, they, uh, uh, there were four candidates. They all called themselves Democratic Republicans, and they were kind of regional. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, ultimately, uh, in the uh, electoral college, uh, Jackson won 99 electoral votes based on 41% of the popular vote. John Quincy Adams came in second with 84 electoral votes and percent of the popular vote. But there were two other candidates. Crawford got 41 electoral votes and 11 percent of the popular vote, and Henry Clay came in fourth with 37 electoral votes and 13 percent of the popular vote. So what does the Constitution tell us we have to do when no candidate gets a majority in the Electoral College? House. To the House. And how many candidates does the House have to choose from? Three. Three, the top three electoral votes. So Clay is the running. He had the fourth ran for the electoral votes. Well, well it's, it's yes. Part of he ran the sentence. The sentence is, but he was not able to be a candidate. Yeah. Of the, uh, so the, house. the deal is cut between Clay and John Quincy Adams. Uh, 
Uh, Clay wrote his electoral votes to John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is elected, and John Quincy Adams makes Clay Secretary of State. And the candidate with the most popular votes, the people's choice, Andrew Jackson, is fed up. Well, this is the birth of the Democratic Party. That uh, this uh, elitist Easterner, as opposed to this you know, fighting general, uh, who's uh, the popular choice. John, so, I have to interject because of the losers in this relevance. Three of those people probably in the third, the top two most proper, belong to the second Christian church. Obviously, they don't call it a standard speech. Church meeting.
returned to the land office for a year and then he resigned because it was time for him to lead the organization of the political campaign for the re-election of his man, Van Buren. And uh, it was called the Log Cabin and Far Sighted Election. And who won? William Henry Harrison, Tippecanoe, the military hero, like Jackson, Williams found themselves a military hero. And uh, uh, he uh, had a running mate, Tippecanoe and Tyler Perdue. Okay. Uh, during this uh, campaign, uh, Lincoln and Douglas were major surrogates. And he debated. Lincoln remembered this campaign later in the campaign of 1852, which was the last gasp of the Whig Party, when Field Scott, uh, horrible election between Franklin Spears and Lincoln Scott. Uh, Lincoln gives his speeches for Scott, and in one of his speeches, he recalls 1840. Uh, and, uh, he is answering a speech that Douglas has given against God out of the East. He says, I was reminded of old times, of the times when Judge Douglas was not so much a greater man than all the rest of us as he is now, of the Harrison campaign 12 years ago, when I used to hear and try to answer many of his speeches. Well, I had to look up in the collected works. Is there a speech by Lincoln? answering votes in this life. And sure enough, here it is. So here's an example of the kind of argument that uh, Douglas inspired uh, in terms of rebuttal. I can't find Douglas speeches from that period. They didn't go out and collect all the collected speeches like they did of Lincoln uh, back in the, uh, in the historical periods of the 50s and before. Uh, Douglas had defended Van Buren's budget. The Whigs were charging that Van Buren was spending too much money, which of course was turning the issue upside down because, you know, the uh, uh, Democrats all said we were for state power and national power, which was gone no, no. You Democrats have made a big federal budget. So Lincoln says, those who heard Mr. Douglas recollect that he indulged himself in a contemptuous expression of pity for me. Now he's got me on thought. But when he went on to say that five millions of the expenditures of 1838 were payments of the French indemnities, which I knew to be untrue, that five millions had been for the post office, which I knew to be untrue, and that ten millions had been for the main boundary war, which I not only knew to be untrue, but supremely ridiculous also, and when I saw that he was stupid enough to hope that I would permit such groundless and audacious assertions to go unexposed, I readily consented that on the score of both veracity and sagacity, the audience should judge whether he or I were the more deserving of the world's contempt. <laughs> now that's, that was 18 work. Uh, Lincoln's reply was uh, published as a Whig campaign uh, document. Uh, but the Whigs didn't carry on. Uh, Harrison was defeated by Van Buren in uh, Illinois, but of course Harrison won the uh, uh, election. The Democrats were blamed for causing an economic depression uh, by eliminating the National Bank. Okay. Oh, that's what I just read. Okay, here we are now in spring. Uh, okay. Van Buren got me. What now are Douglas's prospects of the Patriot issue? Not very good. Okay. Uh, so he becomes a judge of the Illinois Supreme Court, which then, I think, in his final years uh, on the court in, uh, in the Supreme Court chamber. His arrival on the Supreme Court was the result of a political battle between Democrats and Whigs. It's a little thumping, but this is typical of the period. 
The Democratic majority in the legislature tried to remove the Whig Secretary of State and replace him with Stephen Douglas. But the Whig judges of the Supreme Court ruled that the legislature's action was illegal. So the Democrats in the legislature created five new Supreme Court judge positions. And at the age of 28, Douglas was named to the bench instead of being Secretary of State. Uh, this is why politics was the pro football of its day. It was the spectator sport. Uh, but now let's switch from politics to romance. At the age of 19, Henry Todd moved from Springfield uh, from Lexington, Kentucky, and had a wide choice of eligible suitors, uh, including the uh, older and awkward Mr. Lincoln and the younger and excitable Judge Douglas. She knew both of them had good prospects. After two years, she became engaged to Lincoln, but they broke it off and Lincoln fell into deep melancholy. He resigned from the legislature to concentrate on making a living in his law practice. And a year later, they were back together again in November of 1842. 22-year-old Mary Todd married 33-year-old Abraham Lincoln. The question is, did she consider Douglas seriously? One account says he was a regular visitor at the Hilltop Mansion of Mary's sister. The two amused one another with witty drawing room repartee and took home walks together. But Mary was a devoted Whig. Her Kentucky family was friends with Henry Clay, Lincoln's hero. <clears throat> Mary told one of her cousins that Douglas differs from me too widely in politics. Douglas was a Yankee, and Lincoln was a rough diamond from Kentucky. She would polish that stone as the task of a lifetime. <laughs> now there's a story uh, that is told by uh, this woman, Elizabeth Keck, uh, Mary Lincoln's uh, uh, dressmaker and confidante in the White House. And later, uh, she writes a book with uh, recollections uh, of her days in Lincoln White House. And she says, uh, Mrs. Lincoln told her that Douglas once proposed to her. When she declined, he urged his case more strongly and said he intended to become president of the United States. Mary said she replied, You have my best wishes, Mr. Douglas. Still, I cannot consent to be your wife. I shall become Mrs. President, but will not be as Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, is this an incredible story? Uh, Catherine Clinton, the, uh, one of the best biographers of, of Mary Lincoln, uh, really doubts a lot of the credibility of Elizabeth Keckley's uh, uh, accounts. Uh, uh, so, look, uh, on the other hand, I can believe, I don't think Elizabeth Keckley would make this up. I think Mary probably told her something like this. The question is, did Mary make it up? <laughs> and she might have done it. Okay. We go from romance now to politics again. Uh, in 1843, after Lincoln and Mary and Todd got back together, Judge Douglas resigned from the Supreme Court and became the Democratic Congress, uh, candidate for Congress from another district, this time <coughs> the uh, district covering the Western Illinois counties uh, uh, centered on the town of Quincy. And he won election by a narrow margin of 461 votes out of 17,000 in that. So at age 30, he was a house But this is a guy on the move. He almost immediately is looking at a Senate vacancy that has opened up. The United States Senate vacancy. Legislatures have elected uh, a candidate. A Democrat. Why can't he get the, get the Senate seat? So Douglas is one of the two candidates who seriously considered. The, his opponent is a Supreme, former Supreme Court colleague, uh, James Semple, who was a former speaker of the state legislature. And an agreement was being reached between Douglas and Semple that Douglas would appoint Judge Semple's election as the U.S. Senator in exchange for Semple's support for Douglas for the other U.S. Senate seat, which would be coming up two years hence. Uh, now in Congress. Douglas is named chair of the Committee on Territories at a time when new territory was becoming the biggest 
issue and challenge to the American political system. The issue in the 1844 election was no longer the federal government's role in the economy. It was the annexation of Texas. Congressman Douglas became one of the leading proponents of Texas annexation and national expansion to occupy the Oregon Territory, then jointly administered with the British. He said the United States had a moral obligation to admit Texas because a majority of the citizens wanted it, and he was prepared to go to war with Britain to obtain the Oregon Territory. This is a uh, very uh, uh, aggressive young man. Uh, later, he looked back at his thinking in this period. From early youth, I have indulged an enthusiasm which seemed to others wild and romantic in regard to the growth, expansion, and destiny of this republic. The great west and the Pacific coast presented the theater for new and wonderful events. I studied everything pertaining to them until I felt I understood the geography and topography of the country between the Mississippi and the Pacific Ocean quite as accurately as any of the old states of the Union. His candidate was James K. Polk, and Polk advocated the expansion policy that spoke, and his opponent was Henry Clay, Ethan's hero. This was Clay's opportunity for the presidency, but Clay put a on the issue of expansion to Texas, and the voters supported that expansion policy. So, he was elected. And in 1846, war was declared on Mexico. And also in 1846, if you look at that chronology and uh, keep track of it a little bit, uh, it's time for Douglas to be elected to the Senate <laughs> under the agreement that was reached. So, in 1846, uh, uh, Douglas comes to the Senate where he becomes chair of the Senate Committee on Territories. And also, as a new senator, the 34-year-old 34 34-year-old Douglas found a wife. Martha Martin of Rockingham County, North Carolina, was 22 years old and the daughter of a plantation owner. Within four years, they had two sons, Robert and Steve. At the same time uh, Douglas was taking his seat in the Senate, uh, when Lincoln arrives, uh, when they had debated in 1840, their careers had been parallel. Douglas moved forward, but what happened to Lincoln? Anybody want to practice a recollection? Practice law. Mm -hmm. Start practicing law. I mean, Actually, in, 1940, in 1843, he was prepared to uh, leave the practice of law and got his wife a pastime. In 1843, he was prepared and sought to run for Congress. Uh, what happened to him? There were three Whigs who wanted that seat. And they met at a town called Pekin, Illinois. That's what we were doing. <laughs> and in Pekin, an agreement was reached among the three men. They would go take the seat. So at first John Barton, and then Edward Baker, who in the his second son Eddie after, and finally Abraham. So Lincoln had to wait his turn while Douglas was moving ahead. Uh, during the two years in which they served together uh, in Washington, uh, Douglas and Lincoln didn't appear to have much contact. They had some uh, legal business to do regarding clients in Illinois. Uh, but in his first speech as a House member, Lincoln de uh, delivers a uh, resounding attack against Polk and against Polk's uh, decision to call on Congress to declare war on Mexico. And he said there was a problem with Polk's case that he made to the Congress. He was deceiving the Congress 
regarding to what? Spot residue. The spot. Uh, Pope had said that there was this one place where the Mexicans were the aggressors onto Texas American territory. And Lincoln said, there's no clear case that that was Texas American. It was disputed territory. You know, you need to come in and make your case of that. It wasn't against uh, funding the for the war. So, who, of course, replies to Lincoln in the Senate, but Stephen Douglas, and Douglas and Pope, then the war on Mexico, uh, and uh, uh, that continues to be uh, uh, Douglas's position. So now, of course, we have to have another presidential election. That's, uh, you know, that's the lifeblood of these guys. So it's now 1848, and we have Douglas and Lincoln Douglas is married to Southern Bell, so he campaigns for the Democratic ticket in the South. Well, see what, where, where, where Congressman Lincoln went to campaign? Where his candidate, Zachary Taylor, he went to New England. And he campaigned in New England for the Whig ticket. He wasn't up for re-election. Uh, he actually had become fairly unpopular because of his stand on the Mexican war. Uh, so, uh, that was Zachary Taylor and uh, the uh, party system began to disintegrate. Uh, Douglas had, was now at the center of action in Washington and his first achievement was to pass a bill to organize the territorial government in Oregon. Uh, we didn't go to Oregon, it's the British of Oregon. Polk, in fact, was a very statesman-like uh, president. He negotiated a deal in which they split the Oregon Territory, and part of it became Canada, and the other part became the state of Oregon. And uh, you know, Thomas had said, fight for the whole Oregon Territory. So, uh, the uh, Oregon uh, was uh, organizing its territorial government. This was Thomas's committee. And uh, the bill that comes from the House to organize the territorial has a ban on slavery in the Nigerian territory of Oregon. And uh, Douglas persuades uh, fellow Democrats to go along with this ban. Uh, at the same time, there is another proposal to say we will ban all sla slavery in all of the territories acquired by Mexico after the Mexican War. That was called the Billmont Revised, very famous in its day. Um, of war, uh, Lincoln was for the rule of the government. Douglas would not support an across-the-board policy, even though he supported it uh, for the territory of Oregon. Uh, it was clear that this issue of slavery in the territories was critical for the country, but particularly for the Democratic Party, and particularly for this man, a very strange looking figure, who was the Democratic candidate in 1848. This was Lewis Cass of Michigan. And Cass and Douglas were looking for a way to keep the Southern and Northern Democratic groups of the party together. And it was at this point that we came up with a solution which Cass articulated as the presidential candidate. Uh, and that is that each territorial government should have the right based on what their voters wanted to either prohibit or allow slavery. Congress, as a matter of policy, should not intervene. And that this is a, a, a policy that would result either in territories banning slavery and therefore likely to be a, a free state when they enter the union or allow, uh, allowing slavery. Uh, Douglas put it this way as he was campaigning for Cass. I hold that the control of this subject, slavery, belongs entirely to the state or territory which is called upon to determine upon which <coughs> basis its institutions and society should be organized. The general government cannot touch the subject without blatant usurpation. Such is the democratic freedom. Douglas would have been even more in action as he uh, Speaking style. 
but then they would switch and support the South on the fugitive slave act. Then they would support more on banning slavery in the slave trade in D.C., but then they would go to the South and organize in Utah and New Mexico for popular sovereignty. People didn't pay much attention to that provision. But Douglas said that popular sovereignty as adopted in Nevada and <coughs> Utah, I'm sorry, it wasn't New Mexico, it was Nevada and Utah, that uh, that was uh, popular sovereignty vindicated. So, now, Stephen Douglas has worked the uh, Compromise of 1850. He is the most, becoming the most uh, uh, visible Northern Democrat, and it's time for him to run for president. Uh, and uh, he has friends in the South. Uh, he has friends in the North. He's 37 years old, but he runs into a rule of the Democratic Party. He gets a majority of the delegates at the convention, but that's not enough. Because under the Democratic Party rules, how many, how much do you need? Two-thirds. So peace, he doesn't make it, and they have to look for some innocuous candidate who will uh, uh, be a uh, consensus candidate, and uh, they turn uh, instead to this guy, Franklin Pierce who is a former senator from uh, New Hampshire, I guess, uh, a Northern Democrat with summer, Southern sympathies, uh, just like uh, Fillmore was a Whig with Southern sympathies. So, Pierce is elected, and uh, Douglas is re-elected by the Illinois legislature by a margin of 75 to 15 in the legislature. That's Douglas is 37 years old. And then his wife dies. Martha dies in childbirth. Uh, then the daughter died a month later. And Douglas is gone. He uh, leaves for a five month <coughs> trip to Europe. Here out of Europe trying to get over it. Left his two sons behind. <coughs> One story is told about Douglas uh, getting to uh, England. And in England, he's going to be invited to be Queen Victoria. And he's going to uh, uh, be required to dress in royal court to the top. Negro dress. It's not. I'm, a, I'm an Annie Jackson guy. If I'm going to meet the uh, Queen of England, I'll go in dressed as an American in an American business suit. And his visit is canceled. Because Rules. Uh, the Democratic victory in 1852, uh, Pierce, showed that the Whig Party was truly bold. The Whig Party platform, in an attempt to try and keep the South Southern wing in the party, had endorsed the Fugitive Slave Act. And that had really driven the uh, Northern Whigs out of the party. Lincoln still stayed there and campaigned for Scott. But uh, the uh, situation was really <clears throat> uh, right for political transition and uh, transformation. After this five months in Europe, uh, Douglas comes back, back to the job of the chair of the Committee of Territories, but also back to do his job for the people of Illinois. And the issue is the Transcontinental Railroad. And Douglas has already uh, won congressional funding or congressional uh, backing for a law that had Southern support to uh, fund, uh, to give land grants for the Illinois Central Railroad to run from Chicago down to uh, New Orleans. Commerce between the North and the South. Well, now he wants to do the same thing for a transcontinental railroad. And Congress passes a law to provide support for a transcontinental railroad, the question is, where is it going to go? And they give that decision to the president, President Pierce. And President Pierce has filled his cabinet with Southerners, including Jefferson Davis. Uh, and uh, they favor the route that will go from New Orleans across the California. There were two other routes, one to go from St. Louis across, and one to go from Chicago. Well, 
where is Douglas from? He's not from Missouri. <laughs> uh, yes, St. Louis right across the right across the river. He's from Chicago. How is he going to get the Southerners to go along with a route that goes from uh, Chicago? The second problem is that that route is going to have to go through some territory that is colored here in green. What's that territory called? What's it then called? Unorganized uh, territory. Mm -hmm. Nebraska. This is all of that green was unorganized territory that was called Nebraska. And uh, so uh, nobody's going to push a railroad through an unorganized territory that has no government, that's it. it's owned by the United States, but otherwise it's just total anarchy and, uh, and no, no settlement or anything. So you got to organize a territorial government if you're going to get that railroad from Chicago uh, across to the West Coast. So it's with this objective in mind that uh, Douglas uh, wants to fulfill the vision of what he called the ocean-bound nation. Not just California and the Union, but California and the Great ocean-bound And uh, so he comes up with a proposal. And this proposal, designed to gain Southern support, uh, would heal the Missouri compromise so that the Southerners would allow the railroad to go through uh, the territory <coughs> Charge that Douglas was part of a 
conspiracy to poison uh, uh, slavery on the nation. Uh, and uh, we'll see how that works itself out when we get to the debate. Uh, so, the Kansas Nebraska Act was passed, and uh, all hell breaks in the North. Not only had the North uh, Whigs and Democrats been resisting the uh, Fugitive Slave Act, the Fugitive Slave Act said the federal, uh, the slave catchers with federal government authority can march into your community and go to the white men of the community and say, you are our posse and you have to help us catch the fugitive slaves. And once you caught somebody that is alleged to be a fugitive slave, I, the federal slave catcher, get a bonus when I get a slave. And there is no uh, procedure for uh, a free black to be, uh, uh, to be able to go to court to say, wait a minute, I'm being kidnapped. So that's why the Northern anti slavery folks are up in arms over the Fugitive Slave Act. And that's what was passed in 1850. Now, in 1854, the ban on slavery in the territories has been limited, and it becomes an overwhelming issue in the uh, 1854 uh, congressional elections and the Democrats take it on the chin. Slavery is being forced down the throat of Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, Lincoln now comes out of retirement onto the political hustings. Douglas has given a speech in which he has defended popular sovereignty, and it's now time for Lincoln to hit back. He speaks first in Springfield, then he goes to Peoria. He makes sure that Peoria's speech is printed the way he wants it in the newspaper, so that becomes the text of the uh, speech originally given in Springfield as well. So, uh, this is uh, the uh, election in which Douglas and the Douglas Democrats in the North take it on the chin. Only four of the 44 Northern Democrats in the Congress voted for the Kansas-Nebraska Act were reelected. The number of Democratic congressmen from three states fell from 93 to 22. This was a judgment of the Northern folks on Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act, as well as perhaps now on recognizing the, uh, uh, what the Fugitive Slave Act uh, had, was really meaning. So, uh, now, did these former Democrats all rush to become Republicans? Well, we didn't have a Republican party. <laughs> there was an anti-Nebraska movement, uh, sort of similar to an old movement called Free Soil that had emerged previously, anti-slavery Democrats mostly, but they were. Uh, but some called themselves Republicans. But the time was uh, for there to be a new party, and the Republicans began working on The sentiment, this wasn't abolitionist, and Lincoln in his Peoria speech didn't say that I'm an abolitionist. He said the Constitution guarantees slavery in the states where it exists. The Constitution requires the return of fugitive slaves, and just not with these draconian measures of the Fugitive Slave Act. We have to adhere to that, which the abolitionists uh, disregarded. Uh, they were prepared to say there's a higher law in the Constitution, which is what Seward had said in his face. But there was another issue rolling around the country at the same time that was uh, attracting voters. Uh, this issue was immigration. The arrival of tens of thousands of Irish and German immigrants created a backlash, especially because so many were Catholics. <coughs> and they supported the big city Democratic Party organizations. Across the country, anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic groups met secretly to plan ways to restrict their rights to vote and uh, have their own schools. In response to these meetings, people who went to those meetings and were asked about them said, we don't know anything. So they got to be called the know-nothings, the know-nothings. So the voters that fled in the North, the Democratic Party, uh, went to the uh, no uh, as well as to the Republicans, depending on their views on uh, the whole uh, package of issues. So this was Lincoln as he looked when he gave the talk at Peoria. Uh, this was Douglas uh, at the same time uh, championing his own uh, 
views uh, on uh, popular Socrates. And the arguments that they had in 1854 did not change significantly through the next six years, through the, through the presidential election of 1860, through the Lincoln Douglas debates. They were basically the same. Uh, for Douglas, it's a task for political leaders to find ways to compromise their differences, agree to disagree, especially on emotional issues like slavery. He refused to take a public position on the morality of slavery so he could reach across ideological lines. Years later, a friend of Douglas recalled him saying in a private conversation that slavery was a curse beyond computation to both white and black, that the only way to end slavery would be a war, and he couldn't accept that. In public, he argued, popular sovereignty and non-intervention by Congress on the issue of slavery in the territories would keep this great ocean-bound nation together. The founding principles of our independence were self-government and majority rule. Congress had no more authority to intervene on slave property laws in the territories than it had to interfere with slavery in the southern states. He is saying, my position is just like the position of the South. You in the South want slavery? If the folks in the territories want slavery, they ought to be able to have it. If they don't want it, they'll be able to get rid of it. You know, we can keep our country together. Uh, but as the reports came in from Kansas in 1855 and 76, bloody assaults, almost warfare between the settlers in Kansas, as uh, Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate is caned by a, a, a Southerner and uh, seriously injured uh, uh, and unable to return to the Senate in years, emotions are getting higher. And so now we have 1856. Lincoln wants to join Douglas in the Senate in 1854. He ran for the legislature, he wins, drops out of the legislature uh, so he can run for the Senate. Uh, the, uh, uh, in the legislature, he comes within four votes of becoming elected senator, four votes short of joining Douglas uh, in the Senate, but he's still a And four recalcitrant uh, anti-slavery Democrats can't bring themselves to vote for me. And so uh, Lincoln ends up throwing his support to an anti-slavery Democrat uh, and uh, misses his chance to be in the Senate uh, at that time. Okay, now it's 1856. Douglas is trying again to be president. He's again at the convention, but this time he again fails to win the two-thirds majority and the Democrats have to look for another innocuous candidate, former Secretary of State, distinguished minister to the great group, uh, James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. And uh, there's a platform to that. So Douglas takes over the writing of the platform. And uh, he makes sure, as much as he can, popular sovereignty gets into the platform. New states would be admitted regardless of whether their constitutions allowed or prohibited slavery. Not the Southerners were at work, and they made sure that the platform was silent on what you did at the territorial stage of the government. Uh, that was fine with Douglas because the American traditions of self-government meant that the territorial legislatures would decide this on their own. It didn't have to be explicitly spelled out. Platform on the law. Okay, uh, the Southerners also knew there was a case in the Supreme Court, heading to the Supreme Court uh, called Red Scott, where this issue might be addressed. Okay, you can face two opposing candidates. Uh, uh, the Republicans now have their act together, and they have uh, General Fremont, and Fremont uh, comes uh, within. Uh, Fremont wins 114 electoral votes, uh, all from the North, uh, New England, Upper Midwest, and New York, uh, all from the North. 
Bill Moore is the other candidate running on, uh, they don't call themselves nothing, they're the American Party. And in the North, they're the anti immigrant party, and in the South, they're the old Whigs. Well, they can't vote for Republican, they're, they're, they're Southerners. You know, they used to be Whigs. So they flock to the American party. The South is still divided. Uh, they're not going to become Democrats. Uh, they're, they're Whigs. Democrats have always been the, uh, uh, the, uh, the opposition. So this is the uh, world of politics in, 18, uh, in 1856. Uh, the, uh, no Republicans cast, uh, the votes cast in 10 southern states because in those days you had to show up with the votes with your paper, with your ballot. Uh, you set up a table, voters came to you and handed you your ballot and walked over and dropped the, your party's ballot in the, in the box. Well, they would move on to set up a Republican table in any states other than where border states. Uh, but a switch of 35 electoral votes would have elected the Republican. Uh, all he needed was Pennsylvania and one more state, either Indiana or Illinois. So that was the way things were moving uh, after the 1856 election. The Republicans were on the move. And now Douglas returns after that election to Washington and finds him. This is Adele Douglas. Uh, she comes from, uh, she's 21. She's the grand niece of Dolly Madison. She comes from a uh, Maryland Catholic family. Uh, she's uh, educated at the Catholic school in Georgetown. She's very popular. Uh, her family has little income. Uh, but this marriage gave Douglas renewed confidence in himself, a mother for his two sons. And uh, now he's ready to move on to the next stage when the Supreme Court decides that it will solve the country's problems. And Chief Justice Roger Taney declares that the uh, Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional, that Congress never had the power to prohibit slavery in the territories, that therefore Red Scott uh, is uh, not allowed to uh, uh, ever be able to get his freedom by going into a territory uh, that was free because it shouldn't have been free in the first place. Why not? According to Taney, because if you're a slave owner, you own property. And the Constitution in the Fifth Amendment says uh, property may not be deprived of the federal jurisdiction without due process of law. That applies to the federal government. Territories under congressional control of Congress can't take away your property without due process of law. And the Missouri Compromise was a due process. <coughs> well, the Southerners were happy. And the North is building and building. It's furious. The Republicans, the uh, former Democrats, the former Whigs. And uh, now he has put Douglas into position. Uh, territorial governments are under federal jurisdiction. It seems to everybody that uh, uh, it, the territory can't deny slaveholder his property rights any more than Congress would. But Douglas is not ready to give up on popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty is the only way he thinks that he can keep the Democrats together, his friends in the South, the supporters in the North, and maintain the Union. So he gives a speech in which he says, all the Supreme Court was absolutely right in the Dred Scott case. Congress did not have this power. The uh, Supreme Court was right in saying uh, uh, blacks didn't have any citizenship rights under the Constitution or any laws. No legal protections. Uh, so Justice Tony was absolutely, Chief Justice Tony was absolutely right. But there's a restriction on that when it comes to these territories because these are Americans and we aren't going to deprive them of their ability to make their choice as to whether they want slavery or not. That's the important way. So he says, uh, uh, if uh, a territorial government based on the will of its people uh, doesn't enact any implementing legislation to protect the rights of a slaveholder, what he called police legislation, then when the slaveholder brings his slave into that territory, He's not going to be able to get any help from the territorial government. And slave
slavery will de facto be prohibited. And he later uh, uses this argument in the Lincoln Douglas debates, uh, particularly at uh, Freeport, Illinois, and it becomes called the Freeport Doctrine. Uh, so that is, does not make him particularly popular with the Southerners. Then comes another reason. And this is a map of the Kansas territory that shows the settled area of the Kansas territory. Uh, there were two territorial legislatures, one at Thompson and then the other at Topeka. And here's the Missouri line. Uh, okay. uh, the, uh, Time comes for Kansas to uh, adopt a constitution and apply for admission to the Union as a state. And each of these governments uh, writes a constitution, puts it out for a referendum, and it becomes clear that the Topeka Constitution has the great support of the majority of Kansas voters. And that the Lecompton Constitution is uh, not supported. But both send their constitutions off to Washington. And uh, the Southerners tell Senator uh, President Buchanan, you need to support the Compton Constitution uh, because that protects slavery. Uh, so Buchanan sends the Compton Constitution up to the Congress. At this point, Douglas uh, makes his break with uh, Buchanan and the uh, Southern Democrats. He says, this is not popular sovereignty. This is a fraud. The voters want the other constitution. And he leads the fight against congressional adoption of the, uh, the Compton Constitution. Uh, he is uh, ostracized by the Democratic Party. Remember the spoil system? Buchanan issues the order. No Douglas supporter is going to get any patronage from this administration. Uh, Douglas also, by taking on Buchanan, taking on the Compton Constitution, taking on the Southern Democrats, becomes popular with people like this guy. Uh, Republicans in the North, in the East, say, oh, wait a minute, he should be on our side. This is Horace Greeley, the editor of the most widely read Republican paper, the weekly edition is all over the country. Lincoln's been reading it for years. And uh, he and other uh, Eastern Republicans say to the folks in, uh, in uh, Illinois, uh, when Douglas is up for re-election in 1858, you need to support Douglas because he really has now joined our tribe. Well, this is a direct and immediate threat to Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln had wanted to be in the Senate uh, and come real close in, uh, at 54, 55. Now he sees this as a direct threat. Previously, Senate and Senate elections, uh, come back to the election by the legislature. Uh, senatorial candidates didn't campaign statewide for their uh, party's nom uh, nomination and for election by the legislators. But Lincoln broke with president and launched a statewide campaign against Douglas. He insisted that Republicans could not accept popular sovereignty when it meant neutrality on slavery. The Republicans stood for anything. It was a congressional ban on slavery in the territories. Lincoln kicked on this campaign with a deliberately provocative speech in, in uh, uh, which he uh, said America was a house divided could not exist permanently half slave and half free. He said there was a conspiracy to nationalize slavery, and the conspirators were Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James. Stephen Douglas, Franklin Pierce, Roger Pawnee, and James Buchanan. So now comes the challenge. Mr. Lincoln, in a uh, Artist rendering by uh, Lloyd Rostenborg is talking to Douglas and Carrick in uh, Monticello in Grant County, talking about the challenge to debate. 
This is Douglas in the fight of his political life. He pulled no punches. After two terms in Washington, he'd become the most famous Democrat in the Senate. If he won re-election, he would be the leading Democratic candidate for uh, president in 1860. Uh, in the opening debate, Douglas portrayed Lincoln as a radical abolitionist in league with Frederick Douglass, the most famous of the black abolitionists. He accused Lincoln of calling for repeal of the Fugitive Slave Act. He called, uh, he said Lincoln opposed the admission of any new state, even if a majority, where a majority of voters allowed slavery. He claimed uh, that Lincoln was for prohibiting the interstate slave trade. He said Lincoln favored the abolition of slavery in the District of Columbia. He says this was the abolitionist platform, the Frederick Douglass platform, and uh, the people of Illinois don't know this. Well, Lincoln said, you're absolutely wrong on these issues, except for one. One of them. The only issue that I agree with on the abolition of the abolitionist, uh, this abolitionist agenda is prohibiting slavery in the territory. We have the widest agreement on that. Oh, I do support gradual emancipation, emancipation in the District of Columbia, too. But you can't count me or be to be campaigning against the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Act. The Constitution says you have to return the fugitive slaves. Uh, I've never taken a position that opposed the admission of a state where there is a, uh, uh, a admission of a territory to statehood where a majority had uh, allowed slavery. These uh, debates uh, really did uh, deal with fundamental principles, majority rule versus human rights, the powers and limits of constitutional government, the meaning of democracy. They went far beyond the ordinary rhetoric of uh, campaigns, became landmark documents alongside of the Federalist Papers, alongside the arguments between Jefferson and Hamilton in, uh, in uh, Washington's cabinet, uh, the speeches of uh, Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt in uh, 1812. These are where American politics has really considered uh, the most uh, significant political principles. Uh, Lincoln thought so much about debates that he put together after the debates a scrapbook that had all the texts of the debates that had appeared in the newspapers. These could be fair to Douglas, I wrote the Democratic papers to get his text. Uh, fair to me, I wrote the Republican papers and get my text. And I will take this scrapbook to a publisher to publish this book. The Political Debates Between <coughs> Honorable Abraham Lincoln and the Honorable Stephen A. Douglas, and this becomes an enormous seller in 1860 as a campaign document. I think this is about the eighth or tenth edition uh, that I picked up on. So, this is the debate, but it's a shock to sit down and actually read the debate. Uh, yes, there were principal arguments. But you're hit by the exaggerated charges of conspiracy on both sides. Douglas asserted that the United States was founded by and for white men only. Lincoln denied that he supported racial equality. Uh, Douglas charged Lincoln was part of an abolitionist conspiracy. Uh, Douglas accused Doug, uh, Lincoln accused Douglas of conspiring to nationalize slavery. Uh, there were petty arguments, uh, petty accusations little about government principles and a lot about the rough and uh, tumble political name ball uh, that characterized uh, so much of campaigns. So, of course, Douglas lost that election in the public vote. But the apportionment of the legislature was based on the census of 1850. So, all the immigration had come in in the northern part of the state. The northern part of the state was the Republican. Uh, so that's where the popular votes were. But they didn't have representation in the state legislature, so the legislature went to Douglas, and he's back to Washington. And Lincoln's back to the law firm. Uh, after his re-election, uh, Douglas uh, was recognized as the 
preeminent Democratic Party leader uh, in the country. Uh, the debates have been published all over, uh, all over the North. Uh, but his enemies were not Republicans. His enemies, when he returned to Washington to the Senate, were the Southern Democrats. They now mounted a full scale attack on popular sovereignty by proposing legislation to enforce Red Scott, to enforce the, uh, the slaveholders' uh, rights in any territories. Uh, basically saying, uh, uh, yes, Congress has the right to legislate on slavery in the territories. It's going to legislate to protect the property of the slaveholder. So that's what Douglas had to deal with in Washington. So he came up with a very unusual view. With the help of a distinguished historian named George Bancroft, he wrote an art article for Harper's Magazine in 1859 that laid out the case for self-government uh, by the holders of the territories. He said it was a constitutional question. The framers of the Constitution did not intend that Congress should have the power to intervene in the territories and deprive settlers of their rights to make their own laws on purely domestic such as property rights, including slave property. You, know, you want to restrict the property rights of people to have liquor, to sell liquor? You, know, you can restrict that. You can make all kinds of property restrictions. That's all on the state of self government, the Democratic Party. Uh, he's arguing against the uh, Southern Democrats. Uh, and he appealed them. He believed that this would appeal to the moderates in the South. Because the same principle meant southern states forever would be able to have slavery because that's what they wanted, as long as they wanted. Then in October 1859 comes uh, the match that, that the uh, explosive, uh, explosives uh, John Brown. John Brown's raid, uh, Harper's Ferry. Aroused the emotions throughout the South. Douglas is desperately looking for a way to maintain credibility with the moderates in the South. And so he makes what is probably his worst proposal ever on the Senate floor. It would be a federal crime to campaign for anti slavery candidates in slaveholding states. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Uh, Douglas believed he had a chance of keeping the Democratic Party together in 1860. He knew that a candidate endorsed by President Buchanan and supported by the Southern Democrats would stand no chance in the Northern states, in the Western states. The only chance that they have would be to have an issue, uh, a candidate like himself, maybe only himself, who had the ability to bridge and had a policy that sought to bridge between the two. Uh, the two sections of the country. But it wasn't the only issue uh, where Douglas was opposing the South and really aligning himself with the Republicans. Uh, many uh, Northern Democrats agreed on the need for federal programs to uh, promote economic growth, the old Whig agenda, land grants for transcontinental railroad, a homestead act to encourage settlement in the frontier, land grant colleges. Many Northern Democrats were as upset as Republicans when these bills were blocked by Southerners in the Senate or by vetoes by President McCain. So again, Douglas was campaigning on a broader platform than simply uh, popular sovereignty. Uh, now, in 1859, off-year elections were held in Ohio, and uh, friends invited Douglas to come speak for the Democratic candidates. Well, friends on the other side invited Lincoln to come answer Douglas. So, in the fall of 1859, the debate resumes on the same platform, but uh, Lincoln follows Douglas in Columbus and Dayton and Cincinnati. Long speeches, just like the debates, the debates are continued. Uh, but then comes Lincoln's breakthrough in the East. He gets an invitation 
to give us the public address in New York City uh, as he prepared for what would become his Cooper Union speech. He decided to make his target Douglas's article in Harper's Magazine. And he goes to the state capitol, he does the research in American history, and Lincoln uh, arrays the historical evidence against the evidence that Professor Bancroft had arrayed for Douglas in the article uh, in Harper's. And uh, he's taking on, not Douglas, he's taking on one of the most distinguished historians in the country, uh, uh, Bancroft. Uh, and he uses his uh, research to allay to the evidence that it was the intent of the framers that Congress should have the power to legislate on slavery in the territories. And his key argument is the Northwest Ter uh, Territory Law that uh, uh, created uh, the uh, states, the, the territory that would become the states of Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin and Michigan. And Congress, uh, uh, the same uh, men who voted for the Constitution, uh, supported a prohibition on slavery by the Congress in the territories. Now, there happened to be the Continental Congress, but there was later implementation by the Constitution, Congress created by the Constitution. So, Lincoln uses Douglas as a foil to show uncommitted New Yorkers in person that this tall, rough hewn Republican from Illinois who gets his picture taken at the Brady Studio in New York uh, was a match was a famous leader of the Democrats. Uh, now, the Democrats had their convention in the worst possible place for Douglas. Where would you find the least sympathy for Douglas in the South? Richmond or Montgomery? Savannah. Charleston. 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 Uh, South Carolina. Uh, the, uh, The Douglas supporters who went along thought, well, this is a sob to the Southerners, you know, to let us let them have a convention in the South. And, you know, they will come in with more votes, uh, and this time he is the nominee. So, uh, the crunch came over the platform uh, for the Democratic Party. On the platform committee, like in the U.S. Senate, each state had one vote. So the platform comes out endorsing the Southern Democratic position that Congress should pass slave codes in the states and the territories to implement the Red Scott Well, you get to the floor of the convention, and the delegates are chosen by population. And so the Northern delegates reject the uh, Southern Democrats' uh, platform, and they adopt a compromise plan. The, doc, the Douglas would support that basically said this technical issue of whether Congress can legislate to overcome the self-government in the territories is a constitutional question that should be resolved by the Supreme Court. It takes on it. And Douglas was willing to go along with that. Uh, but the uh, Southern Democrats wouldn't uh, when that platform was adopted. Uh, uh, enough delegates from Slave states walked out that uh, the uh, convention uh, was disrupted, but not so many left that Douglas could get to the So after 57 ballots, the Democratic convention adjourned and uh, to be reconvened uh, six weeks later uh, as two conventions. One in Baltimore that nominated Douglas won in uh, Richmond that nominated Buchanan's vice president, uh, this fellow, young John Breckenridge. Uh, Republicans in between had held their convention in Chicago, took them three ballots quickly. Uh, they disposed in one day uh, of the decision. Uh, sorry, Mr. Seward. Sorry, Mr. Chase. Sorry, uh, the rest of you. Mr. Lincoln can win and will go with him. Uh, and uh, delegations from Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, all of which felt that their states could have, could swing the electoral college to Republicans. They said the guy that can win in our states is not Seward, not Jay, not Jay. 
So Douglas is now uh, campaigning for his country. Uh, he, his message is if a candidate of the sectional Republican, of the sectional Republican Party wins, the southern states will secede and there will be war. I am the peace candidate.
New York Times article on October 17th. Headline, Mr. Douglas willing to give the election to Mr. Lincoln. We credit from a North Carolina newspaper is this letter uh, written in July. Uh, your favor has just been placed in my hands. The words of Judge Douglas as I can at this moment recall them as repeated to me by the Honorable General of my name were as follows. By God, sir, the election should never go into the House. Before it shall go into the House, I will throw it over to Lincoln. The words thus used were accompanied by a violent gesture and perhaps an additional oath. Okay, that's Mayor Douglas. Uh, when the, that was in July, it published until October. What has Douglas decided to do after uh, the returns come in from the state elections in Pennsylvania and Indiana? He turns to his secretary, and his secretary and says, uh, Lincoln will be the new president. I will go south. And what he did was to conclude his campaign by speaking throughout the South, not on who they should vote for, but on why they should not leave the youth if they can submit. So what he has done is not only left the campaign trail to start campaigning against the Civil War, against the session, he has also made sure, and I, I believe, uh, that his first wife was from this would not have appeared in a North Carolina paper, but of course it would be picked up nationally uh, without uh, the Douglas campaign, Douglas's, uh, or the Douglas campaign. So I think it's uh, reasonable to say that uh, Lincoln's uh, election uh, was due in some way uh, to this kind of delegation. Uh, campaign looks like this, White Waves campaign. Election results. Lincoln gets 1.8 billion. Douglas gets 1.3, almost 1.4 billion. Uh, actually, the voters have selected. Record rich has 848,000. Now has 590,000. The public, the people, have selected Lincoln and Douglas. It just so happens that Douglas only gets 12 electoral votes. And uh, Lincoln gets 180. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Lincoln got the new electoral votes. So now it's time to put the election behind us and prepare for the inauguration. And of course, what happens is that some dozen states start seceding. Douglas returns to the Senate, and uh, it's going to be months before the March 4th inauguration. Uh, Douglas uh, does not recognize the right of states to uh, leave the Union. He's trying to find ways to persuade them to come back and to prevent the uh, eight other slave states from seceding. So he has increasingly serious health problems that were recurring during the campaign. Uh, he throws in himself in, to, into the efforts to try and prevent them. Uh, he gets very excited because Congress approves the organization of territories in Colorado and Nevada and Dakota without any restriction on slavery. The Republican platform said, prohibit slavery in the territories. Well, here, slavery is not prohibited. Aha! Yeah, the Republicans have come along with popular sovereignty. Well, that time, by that time, uh, Republicans had a new doctrine. Essentially, it was called Freedom National. And it stood great Scott on his head. Uh, Constitution says, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Blacks are persons. They may not be deprived of their liberty without due process of law. Just turns the Fifth Amendment upside down. Uh, so I said, don't worry, you know, uh, that doctrine will guarantee uh, the outcome uh, in, in the territories. Uh, other proposals swirled around. You know, there was a peace convention that met at Lewis Hotel. Uh, the, uh, Lincoln arrives, and they're still meeting, and uh, there's a deadlock, and it appears as if uh, failure could be Tennessee and uh, Maryland joining the Confederacy. <coughs> Douglas has a long meeting with Lincoln, says, you've got to support some kind of compromise. And then later that night, Lincoln has a late night meeting where the historians disagree.
free on reading the tea leaves. What happened to that meeting? The next morning, the Illinois delegation changes its position and supports the Harry L. Compromise, which doesn't go in the name of Congress, but it gets the convention over in three minutes. Uh, I firmly believe that uh, uh, Lincoln uh, told them to do and said, don't tell anybody I told you. But that's uh, uh, the historian's, uh, that's uh, Mike Burlingame's interpretation in the Harold Holzer season of the other way, so uh, two historians. So finally, as uh, the inauguration day is coming, the night before the inauguration, the Senate has a constitutional amendment that the House has. This is the unamendable constitutional amendment, the first version of the 13th Amendment, that says slavery may not be eliminated in any state that has slavery, and the Constitution may not be amended to change this principle. And with the last possible compromise, and uh, uh, Douglas is the floor manager, it doesn't get approved until the early hours of the morning, and uh, Lincoln, in fact, lukewarmly endorses it in his inaugural address the next morning. And at the inauguration, uh, Mr. Lincoln arrives, and that little table in front of him is too small. He's got his hat on, he takes his hat off, he's put his speech text on the table, and he can't find a place to put his hat, so Douglas has gotten up, and this is Douglas's hat, and this is Lincoln's hat. And he has stepped up and taken Lincoln's hat. <coughs> Uh, that uh, two nights later is the inaugural ball, and Douglas uh, Squires, uh, Mary Lincoln, is looking around the ball, dances, the foot drill. Uh, then comes Fort Sumter. Uh, south attacks Fort Sumter. Uh, Douglas uh, comes to the White House and meets with Lincoln. Lincoln shows him this draft proclamation calling for uh, uh, 75,000 <coughs> troops. Douglas uh, says to the friends later, I told him he ought to call for 200,000 troops. He comes out of the meeting with, uh, with Lincoln after the environmental substance uh, and, and uh, issues this statement that is uh, reported in the press. The substance of the conversation was that Bob Lincoln <coughs> was unalterably opposed to the administration on all its political issues. So he is. Uh, he was prepared to sustain the president in the exercise of all his constitutional functions to preserve the union, maintain the government, defend the federal capital, a firm policy, and prompt answer was necessary. Uh, Lincoln's other rival had joined the team for the war. Uh, they had another meeting soon. Uh, Lincoln got, uh, Douglas got word from Illinois that uh, Democrats were debating which side to take. Should they support Lincoln? And uh, Douglas uh, meets for two hours with Lincoln at the White House. I would like to, I would like to imagine what happened. Uh, they talk about a speaking tour that uh, Douglas is going to take. Defending Lincoln, calling for all Democrats to rally around him. Leaves Washington uh, after that two hour meeting. Last time they saw each other on his way to Springfield, he speaks for national unity before the huge crowds in Columbus, Indianapolis. Uh, his emotional speech, a speech at the Illinois State Capitol, and in this way. This is, this is Douglas as he is now looking after all the strains on his car. There's no path of ambition open for me in the divided country after so long served a united and glorious country. Hence, whatever we may do must be the result of conviction of patriotic duty to whom we owe ourselves, austerity, to the friends of constitutional liberty, and self-government throughout the world. And so the sad part of the grief that I have never before experienced, that I have to contemplate this spiritual struggle, but I believe in my conscience that it is our duty, the duty we owe ourselves, children and our God to protect this government and that flag from every assailant. The last public speech uh, of this uh, he, uh, no, actually, he uh, gave another speech after this in Chicago, and wept and cheered. Uh, there were now only patriots or traitors. Uh, he, uh, 
On May 10th, he collapses with a severe attack of rheumatory, of inflammatory rheumatism with symptoms of typhoid. On June 3rd, he dies. Uh, in Washington, the White House, and all the government buildings are draped in black. The Secretary of War ordered all military units to observe a period of mourning. For two days, he lay in state in Chicago while thousands passed by. Uh, at his funeral, there were 64 Paul Bearers, 16 military companies. Thousands marched to his burial on the south side of the city, overlooking Lake Michigan, where he had planned to live in front of Today, the Douglas tomb rests under a monument completed in 1881 and preserved as a historic site by the state of Vermont. The top of the tall white column built of Vermont stone stands the statue of the little giant arrived at the day of the year now to the greatest. Where is that statue? It's on the south side of Chicago, overlooking Lake Michigan. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot of empty space around it. Used to be a lot of uh, those awful Chicago high rise. <coughs> Robert Taylor Homes. Well, the Robert Taylor Homes. Yeah, they're not here. Yeah. Okay, they've been torn down, but they were. Uh, so, sorry I have uh, used up our time until now, but uh, uh, I uh, just had so much I wanted to get off.
said to unplug it. She didn't say to push a button. But it's like we should. It's probably recording us right now. Yeah, it is. Is that red button?